Hello and welcome to the Shepherd Walwyn podcast series. My name is Jonathan Brown. Shepherd Walwyn is a campaigning book publisher based in London, England. Our purpose is to uncover and promote new ideas to society's oldest problems. And whilst our specialty is ethical economics, something Anthony Werner, our driving force for over 40 years, has pioneered, we have branched out over the years to other related areas such as the environment and the lives and works of society's change agents. These podcasts promote ideas we're convinced can actually help us build a better society for all of us. So have a listen and be sure to share with your friends if you like them, but also tell us what you think. These are debates we all need to be part of. So without further ado, let's get into the interview. Yeah. Um, so, Michael, I'm just wondering where to um, where we go next, really. I just wanted to get into the, the conversations that you had or you started um, with your 1972 first edition of Super Imperialism, which I know... And um, we had a third edition fairly recently. Um, and and given the the, the prescience of that, um, of the, the predictions in that, both of, first of all, the analysis of of the situation for America, the way in which that the um, the balance of payments were all controlled by the um, by you basically U.S. expenditure on the military, um, and then also getting into the the current manifestation of the of the de-dollarization um, challenges that seem to be accelerating through the Ukraine Russia crisis. Um, I just wonder what background do we need to give the the listeners just to to tell them about that how that system um, works and then move into the um, the situation in Ukraine, Russia, and China now. Well, one of the things that people really don't understand is money. Uh, it uh, largely because of the academic discussion. Uh, un- until 1971, when countries would run a balance of payments deficit, they would have to settle it and. Uh, either in gold or they'd have to sell off their industry to uh, uh, creditors, to investors in the payment surplus countries. Well, beginning with the uh, war in Korea in 1950, 1951, the U.S. balance of payments moved into deficit. The entire balance of payments deficit of the United States from the Korean War to the 1970s was a result of its foreign military spending. Well, by the... uh, uh, as the Vietnam War was ending, uh, moving towards its end, the Americans had uh, had to give uh, away gold every single month. Uh, Vietnam had been a French uh, uh, colony, and so the banks there were French, and so as America would uh, spend more dollars uh, in Southeast Asia, these dollars would be sent uh, from the bank branches to their uh, head office in Paris, and uh, the Par- Par- Paris bank would turn over the dollars to the central bank for France, and the central bank under General de Gaulle would then say, here are dollars, give us gold. So, uh, and Germany was doing exactly the same thing, was using its export proceeds that would earn, be paid in dollars, it would turn the dollars over for gold. So America's gold stock was steadily going down and uh, uh, it had to withdraw from the London gold pool, it stopped making the dollar convertible. Well, the US had used, uh, by 1950, when the uh, Korean War began, Amer- the American Federal Re- Treasury had 75% of the world's monetary gold, and it used this monetary power to sort of control uh, uh, diplomacy in other countries. This, the basis of America's political power was its gold stock. Well, once they uh, stopped uh, the gold standard, there was a uh, uh, hand wringing saying, How are we going to? Uh, dominate the world if we don't have gold anymore if we run out, if uh, the military spending abroad has uh, made us run out of gold well uh what i said well once you a uh, country's uh, foreign central banks are going to get these dollars they can't get uh cash them in for gold what are they going to uh use them for well there's only one thing that central banks at that time did and that was to buy government securities so they uh, essentially they uh, central banks of France and Germany and other payment surplus countries would uh, buy treasury bills, treasury bonds. Uh, some of these were special bonds uh, that uh, they, they couldn't sell, uh, but they were stores of value. And uh, so all the money uh, that America was spending abroad was simply recycled to the United States. Uh, the it didn't mean that America had to devalue the dollar. For running a balance of payments deficit, like today's Global South countries does or uh, do, or as England had to do with its stop-go policies, always raising the interest rates uh, 
uh, to borrow. And, and Michael, this insight was that was that when you were working at, at Chase Manhattan and you were advising the State Department on what to do with the the fact that we we're having this balance of payments problem because of well, military. At, at Chase, my job was to analyze basically the balance of payments of third world countries and then of the oil industry. So I had to develop an accounting format to find how much did the oil industry, if you segregate it, actually make from the rest of the world. I had to calculate natural resource rent uh, and uh, uh, how large it was. So I did that uh, uh, from 1964 till about 1967. Then I had, uh, I had so much work to do there, I had to quit to finish my uh, dissertation to get the PhD. And then I developed the system of balance of payments analysis that actually was the way it had been calculated before GDP analysis. Uh, and I went to work for Arthur Anderson for a year, calculating the whole US balance of payments. That's where I found uh, that it was all military uh, in character. And uh, I began to write in popular magazines like Ramparts. Uh, you know, America is going to be running out of gold. This is uh, the uh, the price that America is paying for its uh, military spending abroad is a loss of its economic power. Well, uh, but then I realized uh, as soon as it went off gold in 1971, that uh, uh, now, the new America had a cost-free means of uh, uh, military spending. Suppose you were to go to the grocery store and just pay an IOUs, and uh, you could just keep spending, and uh, you could tell the uh, uh, the uh, uh, owner, the grocer, well, I, I don't have any money to actually pay you the IOUs, but maybe you can give it to the uh, the farmers and the dairy people for uh, the products you get, and you know everybody else will use this as money. And uh, you don't have to, you continue to get your groceries for free. Well, that's how the United States economy works under the dollar standard, or at least it's how it's worked uh, until the present. Uh, and this is what led uh, China and Russia and Iran and uh, other countries to say, we've got to have, the, we don't want America to have a free ride because all of this, uh, these IOUs that it's giving, it uses to uh, surround us with military bases to overthrow us and uh, to threaten to bomb us if we don't do what America tells us to do. So uh, that led all, already a few years ago to uh, pressure to de-dollarize the economy and to make a multipolar world economy, not a, a, a whole, the whole world economy being an extension of the U.S. Defense Department, really the U.S. economy and U.S. Uh, uh, mining firms and oil companies and others, uh, but to actually let other countries keep their economic surplus among themselves to promote their own economic growth instead of imposing uh, IMF dictated austerity programs to impose austerity so that they can pay foreign bondholders. So uh, today, uh, everybody thought that, well, it's going to take years and years for China, Russia, Iran, India, uh, Indonesia to get their act together and to really create an alternative but uh, this year, uh, the Biden administration himself has, uh, thank God for the world, uh, and destroyed uh, America's uh, free lunch. Uh, first, he gra grabbed Venezuela's uh, foreign exchange. Then uh, he grabbed uh, all of the foreign exchange of Afghanistan, just confiscated it. And then uh, a month ago, he confiscated $300 billion of Russia's foreign exchange and said, well, if you've lent money to the U.S., we can grab whatever we want because uh, we get to uh, dictate to you who will be your president. We are the, the one democracy in the world. Democracy means America's military gets to a point your president. And so we don't like the person you've uh, voted in as president for Venezuela. We're going to uh, uh, hire this uh, the little netwit that we uh, bought out, uh, Guaido, and we're going to appoint him president. And we're going to take away all of your gold and we're going to give it to the person that we, America is the bastion of democracy, says uh, uh, should be president so that uh, he can spend it on hiring uh, terrorist groups to kill all of you land reformers, to kill your labor leaders, he, uh, to finance uh, a neo-Nazi takeover there, just like we did in Chile under Pinochet, and just like uh, we've done in uh, Ukraine with uh, funding the neo-Nazis uh, to uh, fight uh, against uh, the Russians there. So uh, this is uh, essentially shocked the rest of the world. Nobody assumed or believed that uh, countries would actually grab 
other countries' uh, financial savings. If you go back to the wars in the 19th century, uh, the Crimean War and the other wars, uh, uh, the, it was pretty much of a uh, war-free period under the Victorian era. But even when there were wars, people, uh, countries would continue to pay their foreign debts uh, and uh, the, the uh, financial obligations. All of this was ended by uh, uh, President Biden who said, we get to, uh, uh, we are rejecting the international uh, rule of law. We have a rules-based order. We can make up the rules. Number one, we are exempt from the rules. Only you have to follow them. Number two, the rules are whatever we say. And this is uh, done what uh, uh, China, Russia, uh, India could, uh, would have taken years to develop by themselves. It's uh, impelled them to create a new economic order independently of the United States and uh, uh, Europe, which is sort of is a satellite currency of the United States. So, so Michael, what we've so this this crazy situation that we've got is that to recognise that even if you have deposits in a bank, the deposits don't really belong to you, which used to be respected. Um, well, they don't belong to you, but they can be stolen. Yeah, well, then, then they don't belong to me, then, do they? They're kind of mine, but right. but not. And likewise, if I if I annoy the wrong person, so for me, I could have my car impounded because I've just denied the local politician, which is essentially what's happened to a Russian oligarch. Now, whether that whether that oligarch deserved um, that five hundred million dollar yacht, obviously they didn't, but it was technically theirs. Um, and so what America is doing is showing that if you piss us off, we will take all your resources, which has happened in other countries, right? You've gone over and we've stolen it. The Britain, Britain did that, right? We appropriated resources and, and stole resources from nations. And um, if you want the best example of that, you can just go into the, the very beautiful British Museum and you see all the artifacts that we've appropriated, one of which was the Rosetta Stone, which I know you, you write about. So, yep. so we've got this situation now that um, the Americans have, have declared, you know, the, the most profound economic war on Russia, um, threatening China that we can do the same. And I mean, China's got, I guess, trillions of, of US dollars. Yeah. Right. And, and one of the things that I don't quite understand, looking at your philosophy, that the, the super imperialism as in demonstrating that the, um, that the Americans can have a free lunch by getting people to buy US Treasury bonds when they give them military funding. Um, or military spending, um, is how is it that the, the US dollar has gone up against all currencies pretty much other than the ruble since declaring, um, or not declaring, but declaring war in Ukraine? Well, Europe has committed uh, economic suicide. The United States asked it to uh, uh, essentially, uh, asked its leaders, uh, we have a, a deal for you. We'll give you a lot of money in your uh, offshore account. We will make sure that your kids get a free education in the United States. But you have to represent the United States, not Germany, not France, not uh, other countries. And uh, the uh, the Americans have been uh, uh, meddling, is the word they use, with uh, uh, the uh, European politics uh, for a year. The European pol politicians do not represent Europe, the, their own countries. They represent uh, the American State Department and uh, uh, American uh, diplomacy. And uh, they were told, uh, we want to, uh, uh, we want to uh, make sure we, uh, that uh, we lock you into our economy. Uh, the Europeans uh, had an idea that Americans really hated, and it was uh, just an awful uh, un-American idea. The Europeans, after 1991, thought that now that communism's over, now we can invest in Russia, we can make money investing there, they can uh, uh, sell our goods, and we can make mutual gains off each other. This drove the Americans crazy. They said, no, we want to make the money off Russia. We want our people to come in and buy the American companies. We want to uh, essentially get uh, uh, make sure that uh, the, uh, the rent-yielding natural resources are given to kleptocrats that can only make their money by sending it abroad to England or to the United States and uh, people in our area. So uh, essentially, they've asked Europe to uh, uh, not buy Russian gas, uh, but to uh, buy, uh, spend seven times as much on buying American liquefied natural gas and spend $5 billion on building the ports 
to uh, accept this gas and go without gas for about three or four years, let their pipes freeze, stop making a uh, fertilizer, uh, uh, don't feed your land, uh, take it on the chin for America. Uh, we want your, your standard of living is going to have to drop by 20%, but it's all for American democracy. And the, Ameri the uh, European head said, that's fine. So uh, the one thing that America said that especially Europe is, uh, you Europeans are bothering the Americans about is you're trying to stop global warming. And that's a direct attack on the whole uh, central of power of the United States, which is the oil industry. Uh, the oil industry controls almost all of the uh, world oil trade. It's the most uh, 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 highest rent yielding industry uh, in the world. It's tax free. Uh, it's uh, very politically powerful, and it's uh, by as long as America can control the oil trade, it can uh, talk to Latin American countries or African countries and say, if you don't do, if you elect an, a leader that we don't like, we can uh, put a sanction on you, and we can stop exporting oil to you, and uh, we can st uh, freeze you out. Uh, what do you think of that? And you won't get fertilizer and we can starve you out. We'll put a sanction on your uh, your food trade. And America, next to oil, agriculture is America's uh, uh, biggest uh, uh, trade surplus uh, item. And, so, and what they're doing with, with um, the conflict in Ukraine, Russia is there also, and China as well, is that they're the other major sources of, of grain, wheat, rice um, that the world uses. Yes. Right? Well, um, uh, the... the the I, I must say I read the British papers, especially the Financial Times, regularly, and there's complete disinformation. Uh, in today's paper, for instance, you had uh, President Biden saying uh, uh, Putin is, con is is creating a world food shortage and famine because Ukraine can't export its grain. Well, what Ukraine did, the neo-Nazi government at the American direction, has put mines all over the Black Sea. So the whole Black Sea and all the ports have uh, mines around them that, uh, well, if a ship hits it, it'll blow a hole in the uh, hull and it'll sink. Well, as a result of that, uh, uh, if you're a shipping company and you want to ex uh, to send uh, grain in, you, you have to get it insurance. Because if you don't have insurance, then you're in danger of going bust if your ship goes under. And uh, no insurance company will insure it until the uh, Ukrainians uh, remove the... Uh, uh, the mines that they put, uh, and you need minesweepers for that. And uh, needless to say, Russia doesn't want American minesweepers in because uh, they're may very well attack. But there's a war on, uh, and uh, so you you have basically the United States blocking uh, Ukrainian uh, grain exports, which was a uh, huge export. You've had uh, your uh, uh, the American dollar area. The NATO countries are uh, refusing to uh, import food uh, agriculture from Russia, and Russia is the world's largest agricultural exporter, uh, with uh, Ukraine uh, following up. So uh, yeah, essentially, uh, you're creating a crisis for uh, uh, global South countries, for Latin America and uh, uh, Africa, by, by all of them. So, so within this, thing, so the advocates of global warming. Uh, uh, the, the Green Party in uh, uh, Germany, its policy is we want global more warming faster. We want to accelerate global warming. They are the main ad, uh, lobbyists for the air polluters. Who's the, the largest air polluter is the American military, the military spending. The Green Party is the pro-military, the pro-war pilot. They're the one, Baerbach and the others in Germany say, you know, we've got to uh, fight Russia more. We've got to uh, provide it with more arms. We've got to fight. They're supporting the uh, the military that is now the largest uh, margin, new contributor to global warming. Uh, and uh, Europe is willing to say, okay, we are willing to have the uh, sea levels rise and other 10 feet, as long as we can help America do, uh, dominate Russia. Well, is this, and we're willing not to make money from Russia ourselves. We want, it's okay, America can make all the money. We, we don't mind uh, paying more for American goods. We understand that America will put tariffs on us, so we can't export more for, more for uh, 
uh, for America, we realize we're going to have to reindustrialize. Well, maybe we'll go back to the 19th century. Maybe Europe will become a country of farmers again when everybody lived in a fairy tale world. I mean, that basically is. Uh, so, so the, Michael, the, 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 I guess the question. So, so that within this sense, so I'd like to come back to the just what what China and and Russia can do given their reserves. Because I understand they've got. They've got lots of reserves of the both are, are gold producing nations as well as gold hoarding, gold buying nations. Um, they've also got large grain stores, um, China having the most, as I understand it. But just going back to this question, can you help me understand why is it? So I've all these nations around the world now who have gold, who have US dollar reserves in some form or other, some of it, some of it actual currency, but most of it in, in bonds. Um, why is the dollar still increasing at this moment in time? Well, because Europe, Europe, the euro is going down. Uh, the Japanese yen is going down. Uh, the, the yen is the worst performing currency. They've held their interest rates uh, very low uh, because they think that this is going to, uh, this will enable the banks to make money by borrowing low uh, at a low rate uh, and uh, lending uh, to foreign countries at a high rate. Well, Europe is also keeping its interest rates very low. The Americans now, the, the Federal Reserve, is raising the interest rate. Now, as it raises the interest rate, money from low interest rate countries, Europe and uh, Japan, are flowing to America. The, the currency values are primarily set by relative interest rates and by capital flows. They're not set by the cost of production uh, for imports and exports. They're not caused by trade. So much, unless there's a radical uh, uh, breakdown of trade, there, there, uh, there's all these zigzags you see are uh, capital, short-term capital movements, and uh, the capital movements. Now that America says we want you countries to keep your interest rates low, so that your banks and financial investors will borrow from your banks cheaply and uh, buy American securities that are uh, yielding uh, higher. Uh, higher returns, and so it's a it's a relative monetary policy. And as long as the euro has a, a set is a satellite currency to the dollar, uh, it's going to uh, continue to go down. So the both the euro and the British sterling are now moving towards a dollar per uh, a dollar per per pound and a dollar per euro. And so, so that's a that's a short term measure. The long term measure is that countries have to start are going to start if they can. To take, get rid of, to sell the the bonds that they've got, the U.S. currency that they've got for something other than the U.S. currency. So long term, it has to come down. Is that right? Yes. And what they're going to do is they're going to hold each other's currencies. Uh, uh, and already you have uh, now that uh, Russia is denominating its exports uh, in rubles instead of dollars, uh, the American banks have lost the. Uh, trade financing of the world oil trade and uh, the world, uh, uh, certainly Russian Russian oil trade and Russian agricultural trade. Uh, and countries will, uh, instead of holding dollars, they'll hold ruble reserves uh, to stabilize their currencies vis-a-vis -vis the ruble. China's holding ruble reserves. The ruble's holding uh, Chinese yen reserves. Uh, and uh, the, the balance will be held more and more in gold and some kind of uh, assets without a liability attached to them. Uh, and uh, much of, the, of what they get uh, internationally, uh, I think the logical uh, direction in which this is moving is that uh, the non-dollar countries will create their own international monetary fund version, their own World Bank, uh, their own trade organization, and there will be a, a set of, a one set of trade and financial and development organizations and military organizations in the U.S., uh, and it's uh, and Europe, uh, the NATO, the white countries, uh, and another set of relations in uh, the non-white countries, the countries that were they're actually developing, uh, uh, while America and Europe uh, shrink and shrink and shrink. So, so your assessment, then, what's what's your what's your assessment of your your ideas around how much gold China actually holds? Because the the, the published numbers are really extraordinarily small, aren't they, for an economy that's so big? I, I don't know. Uh, it, any government can hold uh, gold not only uh, through its own treasury, but through uh, sub, uh, sub, subordinate agencies that can hold gold. Uh, I have no idea. I've, uh, 
uh, I haven't looked, I, I no longer go into the financial statistics like I used to, because it takes a whole year to do a, uh, a balance sheet uh, that is uh, comprehensive. So uh, all, all I know is that they, uh, obviously, they saw what America did to Russia's uh, for, uh, dollar holdings, and they don't want the same thing done to them, since uh, President Biden has said, China is our number one enemy. He said, uh, the, uh, we, we want to destroy the Russian economy, and the only, uh, once we do that, we can attack China. Uh, we want to pry them apart. So obviously, China uh, is reading the newspapers and saying, well, I guess we better uh, avoid that fate. And then and the other thing that I find utterly remarkable, like, so, so for example, Biden in a speech saying, we want to get rid of Putin. Um, and then I think it was, I don't know if it was a US defense secretary or, or um, secretary of state yeah. saying that we want, to arm, but we, want to, we want to arm Taiwan. Yeah. Which is, a, you know, if I was, if I was, a, you know, if I ran China and I said, I want to arm Mexico, or if anyone in South America wants any weapons, then my door's open to you. Um, I would expect the Americans to be very upset with that because I'm, I'm breaching the Monroe, doc, the Monroe doctrine and um, but it just seems to be some like I just can you help me understand having been in in the in the continent in the corridors of power whether it's the you know the, the Chase Chase Manhattan or or the contacts you've got with it you know the Hudson Institute and all those all those guys um, how can how can politicians be so delusional to think they can say stuff like that without having a without having a, neg a negative consequence well, you know who's really upset by that? The Taiwanese. They say, ah, they want to make Taiwan into another Ukraine. They want to, they're willing to fight to the last Taiwanese, uh, uh, just like the uh, Ukraine has done. They, they say, wait a minute, if we do, here, we have two choices before us. If we do arm uh, and get uh, weapons that can hit China, then China's very lot likely to, uh, just, uh, to bomb us. On the other hand, uh, I, I've, I've met uh, uh, Taiwanese officials for, 40 years. Uh, they, many of them say, our long-term plan, you know, we all expect to be reintegrated. We want to be investors in China. We want a merger, but we want a merger under our terms where we can be sort of like Hong Kong, uh, but at least be able to have our own um, a merger that'll make us prosperous too. So now uh, the this choice between do we want to follow the Americans and uh, become uh, uh, the Ukraine of the Pacific or do we want to uh, join with China uh, as uh, China is growing and America shrinking? What are we going to choose? Well, you can. Uh, I, I would imagine that uh, you will see uh, in, uh, a very strong, uh, uh, peaceful integrationist movement uh, uh, with China developing. So the Americans think that the Taiwanese must hate China because they remember that Ch Chiang Kai-shek, you know, uh, uh, massacred the communists in 1927. You know, they're still living in the past. So, so what we're looking at then is because of um, the actions of, of Joe, whoever is in charge, whether it's President Biden or, or other people. So no, uh, President Biden is just the front man. <laughs> uh, they're all the front man for the faceless people in the State Department, the neocons. Basically, right. it's the neocons that are uh, controlling things. Uh, Biden just uh, uh, he's always he's always been a right wing, uh, just a corrupt. Uh, uh, party politician, and all he, he does is uh, do what he's uh, uh, paid to do. So uh, he's he, unimaginative. He's brought in some real Russia haters. Uh, I mean, really, people who have a visceral hatred of, of Russia because of their family background uh, under the czars or under uh, 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 Blinken always said, you know, my family were Jewish and uh, we lost under the czars and under Stalin. I want to kill Russia because I'm so angry at what they did to my uh, my uh, uh, ancestors. Uh, this this is the neocon mentality in uh, a nutshell, and it's a crazy mentality. And uh, the uh, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury officials say they have not been even consulted in these political moves that uh, uh, Biden and Blinken uh, and the neocons are uh, are making. And so there, it's a kind of tunnel. They they're single minded. They really are Russia haters and uh, uh, China haters, and there is a lot of uh, uh, racism there, as uh, you're seeing in New York. It's very dangerous for uh, Asian women to take a subway in New York. Almost every uh, 
uh, every week, the lead news item is uh, yet another uh, Asian woman attacked, pushed in front of a subway or killed or uh, uh, attacked. Uh, there's a there's a new uh, there's a new race hatred in America, and it's uh, they treat the Russians as the Ukrainians do, as if the Slavic speaking people are a separate race. Extraordinary, extraordinary. So that so your your approach so that super imperialism was basically a, a when it came out as I understand it it was used by the State Department to figure out how to continue running their economics and, and yes, how they, people... they said we thought it was going to be a disaster and you've shown us that uh, it's uh, we run rings around the British Empire as my boss Herman Khan put it uh, and they uh, they hired uh, Herman Khan hired me for the Hudson Institute which is a national security institute and uh, brought me to the uh, uh, State Department for meetings with them and uh, brought me to uh, 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 Army War Colleges and Air Force War Colleges, uh, you know, to talk about it. And uh, I, uh, the, the main people who wanted to learn how imperialism works are, I guess I shouldn't be surprised, the imperialists. Uh, I actually thought that the anti-imperialists were going to be my main uh, audience. Uh, but uh, the imperialists really needed to know more than the anti-imperialists. <laughs> they took your book, Super Imperialism, and, and they read it as a love letter, right? Uh -huh. Or at a high, at a high <laughs> Not a long day. I mean, they know that they really, uh, uh, my politics weren't theirs, but it was a good how to do it book. So I was the technician. Right. And 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 working for Herman Kahn, because he's a, he's a powerful guy that people don't talk about so much anymore, right? But he was, he was extraordinarily influential at the time, right? Yes. Uh, he was uh, had a great sense of humor. He was a great speaker. He was absolutely brilliant. Uh, I, uh, he wrote a book on thermonuclear war saying that somehow, even if there is thermonuclear war, somebody's going to be left to survive. And that made him one of the models for Dr. Strangelove uh, uh, in the movie. And uh, uh, I think what uh, when I would sit and hear Herman talk about military, I was awed by how sm he'd thought it all through. He was a brilliant military tactician. He would bring me together and sit down with generals, and they would explain things. And, uh, uh, I, I don't have a good military sense or any military training at all, but uh, he, he, uh, he, he wrote that and uh, he did say personally, he wanted to be under the first hydrogen bomb. He didn't want to live in the post uh, world, uh, uh, nuclear world, but there, there would be uh, some survivors somewhere. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, made him notorious, but then he was so reviled for even having brought up discussion of the topic that needed to be discussed, that uh, he wanted to uh, uh, have something that people liked. And that was uh, the corporate environment study. And uh, that was what I was pretty much in charge of. I was the economist for the Hudson Institute. Uh, he was the uh, military. And we had the same salary. We were, we were equals there. Uh, and uh, we would go around the world disagreeing with each other it would be like a show he'd talk about the world being uh, a cup uh, half full and i'd talk about the cup being full empty as he put it uh and i'd talk about the debt overhead and how debt was uh, uh growing and would ultimately stifle the economy and he'd talk about how productivity would be sufficient to pay debt uh although productivity doesn't necessarily give you the money to pay the debt and productivity does not grow as exponentially as debt grows any rate of interest is a doubling time, and uh, it doubles quicker than the economy can double. And this is really coming back to one of your initial questions from, from Terence McCarthy, which was to focus on productivity, wasn't it really? Yes, uh, and uh, the idea was focusing on productivity. You realize that the, uh, it all comes down to labor ultimately, and how do you make labor more productive? How do you make industry more productive? You get rid of what is unproductive. And the unproductive, the overhead is rent. And so how much of corporate spending is just plain overhead? Uh, how much uh, is unnecessary for corporate industry to take place? And so that bring, grounds you back in cl the classical economics. And Marx is really the last great classical econo economist who pushed it all uh, to the end. And his contribution was saying, just as uh, the landlord uh, exploits uh, uh, in rent, uh, the uh, industrial capitalist uh, exploits labor by uh, having a, 
uh, charging more for the products of labor than it costs to hire labor to produce. However, unlike the, the rentier, unlike the landlord, the capitalist uses this uh, uh, economic uh, surplus value to uh, expand uh, production, to build yet more factories, to expand yet more labor. And all of this is an expanding uh, society, whereas uh, the rent paid to the landlord is a kind of exploitation that is overhead and shrinks industrial capitalism. And that's why he said that the politi political message of industrial capitalism uh, was basically to free society from the landlords and the bankers and the monopolists. And that's why the Communist Manifesto begins with uh, uh, collect rent for the public sector. Uh, you can tax the land as a, a transition to uh, socializing uh, of the land. And that was, that's, that was the Communist Manifesto, right. classical economics. And, and yet, and you have these views, and yet you are still in the, you're a welcome member, a valued member of the team at the Hudson Institute. So what, what did, what did Wait, that I'm a member of uh, welcome where? You were, you were an employee of the Hudson Institute and a very, a very valued one. Yes, because uh, I was explaining how the world worked. And uh, uh, Herm, uh, Herman and I disagreed so much. We, we were friendly, genuine friends. I, I, I liked them. Uh, and uh, we couldn't believe that the other would actually believe something so different. But we said, okay, if this, uh, the argument that we're having is the big argument that's going to determine where the economy is going. Either he's right or I'm right. But uh, people, sh and this is like, the debates between the Henry George followers and the socialists in the early 1900s. It's going to be one world or another. What, uh, what is the key to analyzing the economy? Is it to focus on finance and rent, or is it to focus on technological potential? Well, my point is technological potential can be, uh, can be smothered by uh, so much overhead paid to the rentier class, to the fire sector, finance, insurance, and real estate, that there's no money left to invest and there's no money for wage earners left to spend on buying the goods and services that they produce. Mm. And, yet, and yet the technology sector, they're, in my opinion, they're, they're actually the, the new monopolists, right? So in, instead of having a ah, instead of having a competition, yeah. right? So in that sense, they're the, they're the new landowners. So Google is the landowner. Um, if I want to host these videos, then I've got to negotiate or accept the terms of a landowner, which is called YouTube. Um, and I'm posting that I'm posting them there, but I won't be making any money on it because I'm a you know I'm one of the serfs on on YouTube. Well, this is the problem that China is dealing with in its own way. Uh, what do you do when Jack Ma and other uh, IT specialists uh, end up uh, billionaires? Well, China did not uh, d uh, have a uh, monopoly uh, uh, anti-monopoly group. Uh, it it said, well, okay, we're going to let, let uh, the uh, uh, 100 flowers bloom. We're going to let uh, billionaires uh, develop, but we're going to have them just somehow give uh, transfer their money to the government one way or another. They haven't done this in the way that the Western economies do, by an anti-monopoly tax or by, uh, by the tax system, but by sort of just uh, in a political consensus way. Uh, I'm, uh, in the case of countries like Russia, uh, I'm trying to get them to formalize this into a formally, uh, uh, formally calculating the uh, magnitude of uh, economic rent and uh, figuring out a way of taking uh, it away. You want innovation to take place. You want people to make a fortune, but at a certain point, that's it. They can't uh, somehow make such a big fortune that it ends up crushing the economy. Well, and the other thing as well, I think, looking at your writing from um, from the you know the the Byzantine times and the the ancient the Near East ancient times, is the importance of the leader of the of the of the of that particular economy or society to make sure that no one got so rich that they could overthrow the leader, um, which is really what you've got with someone like a you know well I mean like Zuckerberg right. The power that he was able to wield in the election, whether you agree with him or not, um, was extraordinary. And likewise, if I own a, you know, if you look at the, the fight that's currently going on with, you know, with Elon Musk and, and Twitter, is recognizing that actually we want we want our people to own these resources that we pretend are private, um, but actually have tremendous social power. 
Yes, they financialized politics in America uh, by the uh, Citizens United uh, Supreme Court ruling. Uh, you can pay, uh, you can uh, uh, pay, uh, anyone can contribute as much as they want. If you're a corporation, they will, uh, the politicians and essentially you can uh the the rentier interests have uh given the pro rentier politicians their puppets uh the uh the advertising airtime on television on uh and the media uh in order to overwhelm uh all of the people who would want to uh, uh minimize uh the rentier class so essentially, you, you financialize politics, uh, uh, America much more than uh, has occurred in Europe. Uh, but in, in Europe, it's the uh, right wingers basically that control most of the newspaper, the press, uh, the the uh, uh, the commercial uh, uh, television and media. So if the media are controlled by the right wing with their own agenda, uh, they're uh, they frame the economic issues from the vantage point of the rentier class instead of from the vantage point of how does an economy actually develop and uh, grow wealthier in a fair manner. So that, so just, that's just, I was just thinking about, I know we need to, um, need to wrap up. Um, I'm just thinking about so that the scenarios for Russia and China. So currently we've got, we've got everybody realizing who are not part of the, well, the original white economies, Europe, America, is that if they don't side with America, then, um, they get overthrown. So likewise, but also right now, they've got a short term challenge that the Americans are going to let them starve because they're stopping they're stopping wheat exports coming through the European ports. Um, but then you've also got you got Russia with resources, you've got China with with grain resources. Um, so there is a potential that, that when people start to starve and you look at the, the challenges in Sri Lanka of, of politicians being murdered and um, and people running out of running out of food. Is that there's a chance for China to step in and say, well, we can send you grain exports, and by lucky coincidence, because of the all the lockdowns that China's got right now, they own they've got a whole lot of the of the of the world's boats and ships, right? For yes. currently waiting outside of ports in not all the computer chips, though. That's part of the problem, and that's probably going to make them much friendlier with Taiwan. Amazing. Taiwan has the computer chip. And, and by your assessment, because Taiwan do not want to be another Ukraine, then actually American actions are likely to accelerate the real There's a bell-shaped curve. Uh, some people, uh, there's obviously, uh, it's a political issue in Taiwan. I, I haven't met with Taiwanese in quite a few years, so I don't know up to the date what there is, but I can see what the dynamic is. And uh, just by logic, you can see the envi uh, international environment in which they're operating, and you can think, well, how are they going to calculate the pluses and minuses uh, of uh, the U.S. versus China? But what economy do we want to attach ourselves to so that we can uh, get richer fastest? Yeah, and also as well, just the other thing, stay safe as well, right? And not get involved in unnecessary wars. When you look at the, the, right. the tragedy in the Ukraine, um, of all these people dying for it, when it, when you've got such a strong opponent and such a strong dependency with with Russia, then how can you go to war with them for any any period of time? Well, that's what the world is divided into. The U.S. and uh, Europe are the war. Uh, the, their society is built on war. Their tactic is war. It's the only foreign policy they have because they don't have an economic power anymore. They've deindustrialized. And uh, the rest of the world that is trying to industrialize and trying to feed itself, China, Russia, India, uh, the global south, they're the anti-war part of the world. So the world's divided into two parts. A rentier part supporting finance capitalism is uh, trying to impose it on other countries to financialize all of China and Russia, to, to make it, to put uh, a Margaret Thatcher or a Boris Yeltsin in charge of China if they can to put their own candidates in charge, a, a General Pinochet. And you have the rest of the world trying to defend itself against this terrorism. So uh, what the, the, the Western world that calls itself democracy is the terrorist uh, military world. The world that it calls authoritarian is any authority strong enough to control and tax the financial interests, any economy strong enough to regulate finance and real estate and the economy is by definition authoritarian as opposed to a democracy where Wall Street and the financial centers are the, are the 
central planners. So who's going to plan society? The financial sector or uh, the people as in uh, China and, and uh, other countries? And the people do uh, plan in China. It's, uh, it's by consensus. It's uh, a democratic country. I think that says so it. Yeah, I guess it's um, based from a from a Western lens. That's it. It's a it's a different type of democracy, right? Yes, yes. Um, but a democracy really means uh, is the economy run to benefit the gra- the bulk of the population who happen to be wage earners? Okay. Uh, or is it going to be for the one percent? Is, is the economy run for on behalf of the ninety nine percent and the one percent? Well, the ninety nine the percent need a strong government to run it in their own interests and cope with the counter-revolutionary uh, uh, policies, uh, the neo-feudal policies of the 1%, the Rentier policies. Okay, so knowing, knowing China then, what's your take on the, on the zero COVID policies that, that the, the Chinese authorities are implementing in some parts of the country? Well, the more I read about long COVID here, uh, and I'm 83 years old, uh, so I, I have not gone, my wife and I have not gone to a restaurant uh, since uh, uh, 2020. Uh, we haven't even gone to our friend's house for dinner. We're really scared. We're isolating ourselves. Uh, China has isolated itself at great cost, but uh, it has saved uh, the population from uh, not only having COVID uh, itself as a disease, but uh, having long COVID. And uh, they now say that there are a million Americans with long COVID that uh, uh, is, uh, uh, they say, once you have long COVID, it lowers your in, your uh, IQ by 10%. It's almost as dangerous as inheriting a trust fund when it comes to impairing your IQ. Uh, and uh, it, it's debilitating. My uh, webmaster in Australia uh, uh, has uh, COVID uh, and his family. I mean, it's, uh, 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 I'm very sympathetic uh, with what China is doing, even though it means that I can't go to China because I'd have to be isolated in a hotel room for two weeks and uh, just to give a you know a, a few days uh, meeting and then be isolated when I come back. So China is making a huge uh, effort uh, not to uh, uh, not to uh, sicken its population with COVID. And now, of course, since uh, the Russians have uh, published began to publish all their findings of uh, the U.S. biowarfare labs uh, in Ukraine that were uh, designed to spread uh, COVID-like diseases by, uh, by bir- migrating birds and bats and uh, 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 man-made uh, aircraft over Russia. Now uh, there's, uh, they've reopened the question, was COVID uh, a U.S. biowarfare uh, from uh, the very beginning? And the Chinese uh, are looking at it and saying, was it engineered? Uh, to work if uh, uh, if the Americans are trying to engineer COVID to affect mainly the Slavic population uh, and the DNA signatures, uh, could uh, they have been doing the same thing against uh, uh, other uh, against the Asians? So all of this is suddenly opened up, and until they can settle this uh, uh, this uh, issue, the World Health Organization has refused to divulge any of the U.S. Uh, biowarfare efforts, and the U.S. is uh, stonewalled. Uh, all efforts to find out the bio warfare, and this is like a, the total deal breaker that is breaking up the rest of the world and isolating American Europe. If American Europe is left with its main foreign policy, bio warfare, and the atomic bombs, it will uh, uh, NATO will be shunned by the whole civilized world. And uh, as Rosa Luxemburg said a century ago, the choices between socialism or barbarism, and uh, NATO, uh, Europe, and America represent the barbarism, and the alternative is uh, socialism, which is how the world seemed to be developing uh, in Europe and America until World War I sort of untracked uh, everything. And we may now finally get back on track for the rest of the world. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen to the West. Michael, Michael, as always, it's uh, you always get more getting into your stuff than you expected. Are there any things that you'd like to say to our listeners before we finish up? I've probably said too much, and I hope you can uh, expurgate anything that's really embarrassing. <laughs> Nothing's embarrassing, but we may get, I may get thrown off um, as a surf. I may get thrown off YouTube uh, for <laughs> publishing some of your comments. So we may have to, uh, to go back and review a few of them. But as always, Michael, thanks so much for your time. What we'll do is we'll send a link to everybody for the, for the website and also for the new book um, as well, which I think, and those series of lectures when I was researching for this conversation were 
the single best economic lectures I've ever listened to. Um, so a truly extraordinary levels of insight and 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 real economics rather than theoretical or, or textbook stuff. So as always from from Shepherd Walwyn, thanks so much for your time and and for your contribution. Well, if you transcribe it all, it'll all be worth it. Brilliant, Michael. That's that's our promise, up one hundred percent. So thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to the Shepherd Walwyn podcast. To explore these ideas further, be sure to visit our website www.shepherdwalwin.com and join our mailing list for news and special offers. Check out our authors and buy the books to learn more. And you can also find us on social media. Links are also on the website. And if you like the podcast, please head over to iTunes or Spotify to give us a review. It's surprisingly helpful in getting the ideas out there. So until next time, keep reading. <laughs>